and show us what it is that you want us to change. How can we look more like you? We thank you so much, Lord. And we pray all these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, grab your Bible or your apps or whatever you read on and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We'll be starting in verse 5. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in the back of the pew. Please feel free to grab one. If you don't have a Bible at home, take one of those Bibles home with you. We want everybody here to have a Bible that they can refer to and and read on a weekly basis. So those are yours. Take them. We, We want you to have them. The year was 1986. Many of you in this room remember 1986 very well. Some of you were not even alive. But it's 1986. The place is the Dallas Arena. The event is the 1986 National Basketball Association Slam Dunk Contest. It's looked forward to every year by those who enjoy basketball. But 1986 was especially different for this particular event because in 1986, there was a young man who walked out on the court in this contest, and this young man was the shortest person who had ever taken part in this contest. He was five foot six. Guys, I'm five foot ten. No, I'm not. I'm five foot seven. (laughs) I wish I was five ten. I'm five seven. He's shorter than me. That's saying a lot. Now, you may look up here and go, you look tall. The stage adds 18 inches, guys. I'm a short guy. Five foot six. Some of you know exactly who I'm talking about. A guy named Spud Webb wearing a Hawks jersey. He walks out onto the court and nobody thinks much of it because this guy had only been in the NBA for two seasons and in those two seasons, he had never dunked a ball. Now, mind you, Spud Webb was an amazing, a phenomenal basketball player. He averaged 9.9 points per game throughout his entire career. He was a great basketball player, but he had never dunked up to this point. Spud Webb takes to the court, grabs the basketball, and he's so small that his hand cannot grasp the basketball by itself. He has to hold it with two hands. And he takes off running, dribbling the basketball down the court, takes the leap, grabbing it with both hands, does a double pump, slams it in front of the crowd. The crowd goes nuts. People are holding signs up. 10, give him a 10, that was amazing. The crowd's going wild. This whole time, the defending champion from 1985 is a former teammate of his and looks up and to the cameras goes, oh, I gotta step up my game. Because Spud Webb brought it that day. I can't list all of them by memory, but here's the dunks that he did and completed in that to win the 1986 slam dunk contest. He did a two-handed double pump dunk. That's the one where you jump up, pump it, and drop it in the net with two hands. Then he did an off-the-backboard one-handed jam where he hits the backboard, grabs it as it's coming off, and dunks it into the net. He did a 360-degree helicopter one-handed dunk. So he jumps in the air, spins 360, and dunks it with one hand. Then he did a reverse double pump slam where he spins around and pumps it and then dunks it. And then to win the competition, he does what's called a reverse two-handed strawberry jam from a lob bounce, which means he lobbed it, he hit the ground with it, the ball goes in the air, and as it's coming down towards the net, he jumps up, grabs it, pumps it, and dunks it. Won the competition. Beat everybody out by 50 points. Guys, he's five foot six. And he took the crowd vote by storm in that competition. Now, I never have been a tall person. I was always the shortest kid in my class. And I know, yeah, unbelievable, Chad. You, the shortest person in your class. I didn't hit five foot until my sophomore year of, of high school. I almost said college, that would have been way off. <laughs> sophomore year of high school, I finally hit five foot. I didn't, I wasn't the short, I was the shortest in my class up until my junior year 
when I finally outgrew a young girl named Karina Gonzalez. <laughs> and I looked up to Spud Webb. Guys, I didn't even like basketball, but I looked up to Spud Webb as a kid. He was that guy that I wanted to be. Why? Because he was a short guy like me who had broken all the rules. He had broken the boundaries. He had taken his so-called handicap, I'm handicapped, I guess, and broke every expectation. He was phenomenal. I mean, just on the court, he broke records. He was one of the best players on every team that he played on. And I wanted to be just like him. Now, we're not talking about Spud Webb today, but we are talking about being like someone. So look in your Bibles at Philippians 2. We're going to start in verse 5. Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. And it says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. What an amazing passage. But this passage starts out telling us to be like Christ. And let me just be honest here with you. Even as a pastor, I hear that phrase, to be like Christ, and I go, hello, unrealistic expectation. Do any of you ever feel like this, where... You hear, you know, you need to be like Christ, but you look at your life and go, how could I ever be like Christ? I am broken. I'm sinful. Uh, I'm damaged. I'm a human. I'm weak. Everything that Christ is not. So how do you expect me, Lord, to be like Christ? Have you ever had that thought or felt that way? Because we're all broken. We all fall short. But the Bible still calls us to be like Christ. So how can we possibly do that? Verse 5 says it all. It says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind. Well, what mind is that? Well, we'll look back at that here in just a minute. But what was he like? If we look at Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 11, Galatians 3, Ephesians 5, and many, many others, it says to be imitators of Christ, to be like Christ, to live like Christ. But what was he like? I think verses six through eight say it really well. Look at Philippians two, six through eight. It says, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now let's clear up some confusion on this passage because it's a lot of fancy words that can kind of jumble our brain a little bit. Let me just say this. Jesus was and is. He was and is. And I know you're in your mind going, he was and is. Uh, where's the end of that sentence? Where's the direct object? That's all you need when it comes to Jesus. He was and he is. But if you need a direct object, if you need a conclusion to that sentence, he was and is God. He was God from the beginning, before time began, eternally, and he is God now and will be eternally. Look at John chapter 1, verse 1 for the, the proof of this, if you need that. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, talking about Jesus, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus was, and Jesus is, and Jesus always will be God. But 
Philippians 2 verse 6 has this phrase that's really confusing. It says that Jesus was in the form of God. And let me be very blunt and very honest with you here. The New Testament was written in Greek, and the English translation of this phrase does not do it justice. The Greek word there for form, it's form of God, the Greek word is morphe. It's the root that we get the word metamorphosis. And when something metamorphs into something, it literally turns and changes completely into something else. To morphe in Greek means this. It means to have the exact same nature and exact same characteristics. So if we take that and say Jesus had the exact same nature and exact same characteristics as God, what does that mean? He was God. If I come to you and say, I have the exact same nature and the exact same characteristics as a five foot seven balding young man. That means that I'm a five foot seven balding young man. That's what it means. And so Jesus was and is God. We have to be very clear about that. But that doesn't help our scenario, the question that we're asking, right? The question is, how do we be like Christ? Well, if Christ is God, I got no hope. (laughs) I'm never going to be God. It doesn't matter how good I am. It doesn't matter how hard I work. It doesn't matter how much I sacrifice or serve. I will never be God. Ever, 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 ever. Because I will always fall short of the glory of God. I will always be lacking. Romans 3, Romans 6. So how can we be like Christ if Christ is God? Well, verse 7 opens the door for that. It says that he emptied himself. He became nothing, taking the form of the servant and becoming a man, just like you and I. He became a human. And guys, let's not sugarcoat this. That was a huge sacrifice on his part because where was he before he came to earth in the form of Jesus the man? He was Jesus the God in heaven. Heaven being a perfect place with no suffering, no pain, no sorrow, where not only that, he was worshiped. The angels sang his praises and and declared his glory day in and day out. Why would anyone want to leave that? Have you ever been on a vacation and you went, oh, I never want to leave. Have you ever had that that, that, I mean, we always get to the point where we go, okay, I'm ready to go home now. But have you ever been like two days into your vacation and go, I never want to leave. This is awesome. This is perfect. Take that feeling, multiply it times infinity, add 20, and then multiply it times infinity again. That's what heaven's like. And that's where Jesus was. So why would anyone in their right mind give that up to come to this planet and be hot and uncomfortable And cold. He didn't live in Arizona, guys. (laughs) And to be mocked and ridiculed and spit on and beaten almost to death and then hang on a cross. Why would anyone do that? Why would anybody give up heaven to do that? John 3, 16. Because he loves us that much. He was seriously, completely compelled by his love. He could not resist his desire to save us. He gave up perfection and glory and worship and praise to love us. Because without him, without his sacrifice, we're out of luck. We got no hope. And so he came because he was compelled by his love. But that still doesn't answer our question. How can I be like Christ? Well, I've got something else to think about here. We know that Jesus was and is, but Jesus can also identify with us. Jesus can identify with us. Hebrews 4.15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was a human just like you and I. He came to this earth. He suffered. He dealt with the the difficulties that a life on this earth throws at us day in and day out. 
He was tempted and he, he dealt with those temptations. Verse 7 says that he humbled himself. He took himself to be nothing and became a servant and took human form. He had to live through the same power that every one of us as followers of Christ have to live through. He had to live now through the knowledge that he had of God the Father. Because he's not in heaven, so he's not sitting at the right hand in perfect communion with the Father anymore. He had to depend on his knowledge of God. He had to depend on prayer, just like we do. The Bible says over and over that Jesus' habit was to every evening go off by himself where no one would bother him and spend hours praying. So he had to live through the power of the knowledge of God, the, through the power of prayer. And then he also had to live through the power that's provided through the Holy Spirit. He had to live through that, just like you and I have to do. He had to depend on the same power that we have to depend on. He had to practice the same spiritual disciplines that we have to practice in knowing God and praying to him and, and living through his spirit. He's been where you've been. He's been where you are right now. And he's been where you're going to be. And on a side note, he knows exactly how you're going to get through and get out of where you're at right now or where you're going to go through. Because he's God. He knows what we're going through. He can identify. The fact is, if Jesus isn't like us, then we don't have to be like him. Because it's unfair for God to tell us, be like Christ, be like God, but not provide a God that can even identify with our struggles. So Jesus came and lived a horrible life and dealt with the temptations and struggles so that he could identify with us. But this still doesn't answer the question. How do we be like Christ? How do we live like Christ? Because Jesus is like us, so we need to be like him. So how do we do that? Here's the answer. Third point. Jesus had the right attitude. Jesus had the right attitude. Verse 6 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ. Have this mind. What mind? Well, Chad preached on it last week. Have this mind. If you go back to verses 1 through 5, this mind is talking about love and humility. And guys, Jesus was the perfect example of love and humility. You could not find in the annals of history a person that was more perfect in his love or more perfect in his humility. But what does that look like for us? Humility means this. It means that we recognize that we are not equal with God. What does this passage say? Jesus did not consider it possible to be equal with God. We are not God. He is. He's smarter. He's bigger. He's stronger. He's better in every way than we are. And he knows better than we do. Humility is recognizing that and living accordingly. And so we have to recognize that he knows better than we do. But let's face it, we're humans, which means we are horribly stubborn, right? We say, and we can say it all day long, that we are humble and we recognize that God is God and we're not. But living it out, that's a whole other bag of tricks. I mean, that's, that's difficult because of our stubbornness. So I've got three questions that I want you to answer to yourself to help you figure out how you can be more like Christ, how you can live out this humility that is described in Philippians chapter two. And the first question is this, do you demand your rights or do you let them go to his understanding and guidance? I have a right to this. It's my right to do this or say this or be this. Guys, I will tell you right now, I am very, very proud of being an American. I love the fact that I was born in this great nation and I love the rights and I love the privileges and I love the blessings that being an American has given me. I love it. But I love serving God more. And the moment that my pride as an American overrides my obedience to God, I've just made my 
America an idol in my life. Don't do that. Don't say, I need to do this. This is my right, while denying what God commands you to do. A great example of this is what happened Friday night in Phoenix. A group of bikers gathered together, protested in front of a mosque. Many of them doing so in the name of Jesus Christ. And when they arrived, they cussed people out, threw out horrible, hateful phrases, all at that same time saying they were Christians because they had the right to do so. In their case, America had become an idol because they were disobeying God because of their pride in America. What does God say about our enemies or even people we don't like, however you want to view someone? It says love them, it says pray for them, and it says bless them. And those bikers, many of them in the name of Christ, did the direct opposite. When your pride as an American overrides your obedience to God, you've just placed an idol in your life. Don't do that. Yes, you have rights, but your rights are determined by God's word, not by some nation, not by some law. Find your identity, not so much as an American, but as a follower of Christ. That should be your number one identity. The second question is this. Do you seek your own, or do you seek His own. Because think about the life of Jesus. As he was suffering for our sins, he was beaten for hours. And he was spit on and he was called names and he was mocked and ridiculed. And then he had to carry his cross all the way up to Golgotha. And then once he was there, he had to hang on that cross. As he's hanging on the cross, what did he ask the Father to do to the people that was doing all these things to him? Forgive them. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. That's humility. That's humility. It was giving up his own and recognizing that he needed to come under the subjugation, the submission of the Father. In your suffering, in your hurt, in your anger, in your sadness, in your loneliness, do you still point people to Christ? Or are you throwing yourself a pity party? Because, guys, I can tell you as someone who has studied church history, some of the greatest growth in the church as far as people coming to know Christ, some of the greatest times that that's happened is when people were in great suffering. And Christians stepped up and showed those who suffered what the hope of Christ was all about. And when you're going through suffering, people are watching you and they're listening to the way you respond. And if you're throwing a pity party and everything's doom and gloom, why would anybody want to accept Christ if that's what Christ has to offer? Christ is about hope. Christ is about life change. And so if we're truly followers of Christ, we need to point to him no matter what our circumstances, no matter how bad things get. But do we do that? Then the third question. Do we live, do do you live your way or submit to his way? Do you live your way or do you submit to his way? How many of you have a obedience point? In other words, I'm gonna follow God as long as God doesn't make me cross this line of obedience. What's your obedience point? Is it financial difficulty? You know, God, as long as I'm uh, financially secure and I can pay all my bills, I'll follow you. But if things get tough financially, I'm going to follow my own wisdom and you're just going to need to take a back seat to this because I know better. Is that your obedience point? Is sexual purity your obedience point? You know, the girl down the street is hot. That's no excuse. Is that your obedience point? Is your anger or controlling your tongue, is that your obedience point? You know, Lord, I love you, I'll follow you, but uh, I'm about to get really upset. Can you go in the other room so you don't see or hear what I'm about to say and do? Because it's gonna get ugly for a minute. I just need you to step away. What's your obedience point? If I walked into my home this afternoon after church 
And I walked up to my wife and I said to her, Jana, I love you with all of my heart. I am yours. My life is yours. I will be true to you. I will dedicate myself to you. You're the only one that I have eyes for. But tomorrow morning, I'm going to go down the street and sleep with the attractive woman that are two doors down. As soon as I finished that phrase, my life would probably stop. Just FYI. You'd find me in pieces out in the desert. I love my wife, but don't cross her. (laughs) But don't we do that with God? We say, God, I'm I'm totally dedicated to you, and you're the only one for me. And and I won't sacrifice uh, any any of my personal, I will give everything. Everything's yours. I'm going to just lay my whole life before you, except this one little thing. I'm going to cheat on you with this one sin. And I need you to be okay with that. Is that okay, God? Thanks. We do that. We cheat on him all the time. If our spouses would not accept that, why should we think that God would accept that? So live your life in full submission to God. Not just some of the parts of your life, but all of the parts of your life. Your marriage expects that. Why wouldn't God? Last week, Chad said, embrace the identity of a servant. He was talking about embracing the identity of a servant rather than doing acts of service. That embracing the identity was what Christ was calling us to. And I'm saying the same thing, guys. Embrace the mind of Christ. If you want to be like Christ, if you want to follow what Philippians 2, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 3 Ephesians 5, if you want to follow those passages and be imitators and follow Christ, it means that we have the mind of Christ. And according to Philippians 2, verses 1 through 5, that means that we love and it means that we're humble, that we submit totally to him because we recognize he's God and we are not. So here's my question to close out this morning. What are the areas, what are the sins that you have not put under God's submission yet? What are those things that you're still holding on to and you're saying, God, I'm gonna be obedient all my life. Everything's yours except for this one thing. What's that one thing? And what do you need to do through humility to give it to him? Join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for this time, for this opportunity We thank you for the chance to be in your house and to worship you, but God, don't let us leave here the same way we came in. Lord, let us be a people that step up and follow your commands and do what we know is the right thing to do. Help us to completely live in love and humility, recognizing that you are God and we are not. Help us to do that today. Show us how to overcome those areas in our lives that we haven't given to you. We thank you and we praise you. And we lift all this up to you in your son's name, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.